these tensions are getting ever greater, there's going to be a point where the public is going to have to approve these things. And if they do, that's either war on a massive level or it's a complete shifting um, international norm because the alternative, I think, is realizing that the the American-led rules-based order, you know, is under threat from different challenges. And it's going to be up to us to decide how much we concede uh, to other norms, right? So I think that's where we are. And either way, our current paradigm is being challenged. It's a question of whether we, we fight or we don't fight, you know? That's how I see it. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome or welcome back to another conversation in our collection of podcast series that focuses on markets and investing from a number of different and fascinating perspectives. In the Galactic Macro series, we want to explore and be part of the discussions that relate to the unexplained and unknown objects, as well as what's going on in the world of AI, because these two seemingly unrelated topics may indeed be related. This is a series that I not only find incredibly interesting, as well as intellectually challenging, but also very important, given the strong momentum we see at the moment in terms of releasing previously classified information, as well as the exponential adoption of AI tools by the wider public. We want to dig deep into the minds of some of the most prominent experts to help us better understand what this new galactic macro world may look like and how you should think about positioning yourself for it. And we want to explore their perspectives on a host of game-changing issues and hopefully dig out nuances in their work through meaningful conversations. So please enjoy today's episode hosted by David Dahl. Niels, thank you for the introduction. Isabella, Dario, pleasure to have you guys with us today. Um, excited to bring in some, some talented financial journalists and especially two journalists that have been covering some of the, some of the corners of, of world events that I think a lot of the, the industry has overlooked. And so I'm happy to have you guys on the program with us today. Welcome. Thank you very much. So one of my, my curiosities, I've, I've followed your work for a long time, and unless I'm mistaken, I think that you two are probably the very first to, to even kind of look at UAP and even have discussions around this um, from the financial sector. And UAP is becoming a, a, a big conversation, unidentified aerial phenomenon. And there's been a lot of things coming out about this lately. And I wanted to I wanted to bring in some professionals and and get you guys' take. How how did this subject make it onto, you know, some financial journalists uh, radars? So I think I'll take the lead there. So I was leaving the FT, um, I think it was end of December 20, no, 2021. And uh, I was you know, this story was percolating around and um, and I'd noticed that there was this sort of creeping um, respectability being applied to the story, whereas obviously for years and years, you know, mentioning UAPs was, was big, very taboo. And I always, you know, I'm, I'm interested in markets, I'm inf interested in information theory, I'm interested in blind spots and like what people are missing. And the reason I was always interested in the UAP thing is because obviously there is an anomaly. Either there's lots and lots of people like having delusions, uh, aliens are real, or there is a massive kind of like government cover up. All three of those options, I mean, those are the only three possibilities in my mind. 
And all three of those pose an interesting kind of information black hole for markets, right? So I thought, given the kind of growing acceptance of the story uh, as, a, as, a, as a real phenomenon, it's worth like, you know, staking, putting a stake into it um, from a financial perspective. So I wrote a little story kind of entitled, you know, do, do, do portfolios have a UAP risk? Not least because I was surprised to find a couple of like SEC filings where people had started like mentioning it in, in their um, exposures and risk factors. And, you know, I just went through these kind of known knowns, unknown unknowns and unknown unknown type of like, you know, theories. And um, and as a result, you know, it got published and I I got some interesting feedback. And it turns out there's a lot of very respectable, high level people who were thinking similar things. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, we believe in aliens or anything like that, but it, it it is an information conundrum, and that's how I was approaching it. And actually, that's I think how, that's how we, me and Dario met because Dario read my story and, co- and contacted me. Um, and uh, he he had previously been working at Kroll, uh, which is a uh, well. I'll tell. I'll let Dario tell his story. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm sure you could tell it just as well. Yeah, so I was working at Kroll, and. When the UFO information started filing through in through these serious channels like the NDAA and uh, the the start of um, the predecessor of the Old Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, I think uh, this was around the summer of 2021. Is when I realized that it doesn't it, the question of are we alone or not is maybe a few steps away, and it's naturally what everybody is preoccupied with. But that before we even get there. Uh, I was, you know, it struck me that uh, it's logical that the first thing we should think is that getting there, getting to the step of accepting we're not alone, that there are going to be financial costs borne by people who have been ignoring this issue. And naturally, the first thing that came to mind uh, where this could have been an issue is for commercial airliners. Ever since I was a kid, I was, you know, told or or implied that uh, commercial pilots um, saw things and were not allowed to report them. And then it very much surprised me that in my preliminary investigations into this, that these reports were true. Not only that pilots were uh, handed cease and desist letters for talking about UAP safety issues publicly, um, but that pilots aren't even allowed to report uh, UFO, uh, anything with the name UFO in, in most aerial uh, regulators in, in the Western in Western Europe. You're actually not allowed to file that through the official normal channels. And so having that information at my disposal, seeing, like Izzy was saying, that the tide of the conversation was turning, I focused my attention on seeing if I could build the sort of a, a product for airlines to have some sort of uh, internal investigation to see if uh, the airlines had improperly treated uh, employees um, that had reported genuine safety issues. And it was while I was preparing uh, this kind of a business development proposal, which surprisingly enough, had some middling support at the higher levels of, of crawl, but it was a preliminary business development uh, proposal to get approved. And then as I was doing that, one of the, I think it was a day before I was meant to present it, Isabella's article came out and it was almost a meant to be thing. I emailed her at 12.30 and I thought, who am I edit, you know, emailing the editor of FD Alphaville at 12.30 and then Isabella replied like five minutes later and I said, okay, <laughs> it was fine. That's amazing, guys. And, you know, I think that it's worth highlighting both of the things that you guys, you know, said there is that, you know, who who would have ever thought about the impact to airline stocks, as an example, with a pandemic? And yet that was, you know, was a major, major hit. And a lot of people did not have that on their radar as as an event, as a fat tail risk. And I see the, you know, the issue of UAP very similar. And Isabella, you, you touched on something that's, that's quite interesting. I wasn't even aware. This is something that we've talked about within our, you know, investment shop is when will we see, you know, UAP really start to become a, a common risk disclosure. Um, and I was not aware that that's, it sounds like that's already happened. Um, w- what were the companies that were, were highlighting that and, and what was the language? I mean, it's very fringe. I'm, I, the one that I saw was an ETF provider um, offering s- uh, space exposure, right? So space stocks, and uh, and that was. I don't. I mean, I almost. I, I don't know. 
I don't know if lawyers put tongue and cheek risk factors into things. Um, but I did speak with the with the issuer and and you know, I think his approach was again like quite curious. They launched this space CTF and and they were quite keen, you know, and to cover all their bases, I guess. <laughs> and um, you know, if you're if you're if you're if you're managing a portfolio that has exposure to mining, you know, space mining or so and now is like space solar and all these different really, you know, the last couple of years has seen such amazing kind of science fiction level things come into reality that, um, you know, I d- I'm not so surprised that a forward thinking um, sort of portfolio manager might might want to account for that sort of risk. Um, and, and I think it's really important to frame the conversation in terms of what we mean by UAPs, because it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, otherworldly uh, intelligence. I mean, it might do. I'm not going to dismiss it. I really don't know. <laughs> but um, but it could also mean sort of technology that we ourselves invent that has unintended sort of consequences or perhaps uses, you know, different parts of physics and, and who knows what, you know, black projects, uh, black ops projects are doing on different governments, whether it's us or our, our adversaries. But if there are strange sort of peculiar crossovers into, you know, people saying that some, you know, say there's like a new theory of gravity or something like that, and there are unintended externalities from use, using that technology, well, then that is something that we need to all be aware of. And and like with any new technology, it has to be tested and seen if it's, you know, and, and seen if it's safe. And there is a risk maybe that the pressure of kind of geopolitical pressure and pressure um, between different nation states encourages a sort of secretive approach to this technology, which then may create a tragedy of the commons like we, like we saw with with COVID. I mean, to some degree, if you buy the lab leak theory, and again, this is, is another interesting analogy because when, you know, in the early days of COVID, 2020, 2021, suggesting that COVID may have leaked from a lab was incredibly taboo. You couldn't say it in polite com- company without being dismissed as a nutter. And now, of course, it's completely changed. So like last weekend, we saw a big front page from the Sunday Times, you know, 90% of that story was known back in 2020, but it's only now that there has been a sort of change, shift in the in in the kind of Overton window to allow a, a proper serious discussion about it. But again, what we find out from that story is that these projects were happening, you know, st- in stealth, and the spillovers came into the public domain with huge collateral damage and and, and a tragedy of the commons. So. I wouldn't be, you know, I my approach from a financial perspective is that could be exactly the same with UAP. You've got different secret projects warping, like it's not gain of function, but gain of function is kind of like, you know, we're at the levels of technology where it's almost like magic, you know, the, th- the stuff that can, it can be very good or it can be very bad. And, you know, now also the other topic that's become very normalized is this idea of AI apocalypse. So as technology gets very powerful, the externalities get very powerful, like on a magnitude that is ever greater, right? So you, you're dealing with heaven and hell, like your apocalypse and, you, you know, utopia. And that and that's kind of, kind of how I see UAPs. And we as price setters of risk in the markets – I mean, how do you price an apocalypse risk? I don't know how you price apocalypse <laughs> risk. Apocalypse insurance is surely, uh, I don't know who issues that. <laughs> but that's, that, that's right. We need to talk to Lloyds of London and, uh, and create some new risk uh, insurance. We actually did. We spoke to, well, I mean, the, they prefer to remain anonymous, but we spoke to a war insurer uh, that was affiliated with Lloyds of London. Maybe this is getting ahead into the conversation where this ought to be going. Um, no, please share. But there was, I remember that, so we spoke with Ryan Graves and just to the point that Isabella was making about we're not saying what UAP are, there was a really excellent quote by Ryan uh, on this point, which is in the February shootdowns of you of whatever they were, that there was a lot of people in the press saying, it doesn't matter, they weren't flying saucers, they were just balloons. And Ryan said, they didn't realize neither of those is an acceptable response. 
it doesn't matter what's in the sky if we don't know what it is and if it's doing something that we don't understand and it's potentially causing aerial safety hazards that's a problem we don't need it to be alien right and then the interesting bit is maybe that the current disclosures that we'll get into with david grush of course does change the nature of that conversation right because it there's the inspector general of you know the intelligence community in the united states is very much implying uh, all of this is very much implying that there's a direction that this is going and that unlike um i forgot the chair of the i think it was david spergel who's the chair of the nasa panel who referred to uap very usefully i think as a haystack um and that is what it is it's it's a haystack risk there is there are a lot of different individual haystacks that can be anything from a from a balloon to a fireball to an actual flying saucer a, you know an extraterrestrial flying saucer maybe a human flying saucer but we don't know what they are and that's why they're bundled together yeah and i i think it might be useful too so a couple things come to mind you know when we talk about just the the aerial risk right and and i think that it's why don't you maybe share with the audience who ryan graves is because some people listening may not know uh ryan graves and and the important role that he's he's taken on just in the last uh, couple of years in the conversation absolutely so ryan graves has has come uh from a bit nowhere into becoming one of the most important voices in the united states and the world on the topic of aerial safety um he spoke to us in his capacity as uh as um executive i think it's he's the executive director or at least a co-founder of Americans for Safe Aerospace they have a great team they've put together a fantastic team it's a pilot it's essentially a pilot led advocacy group that aims to raise awareness in congress um by providing funding and information resources to congressmen and sen- and senators to tackle the UAP issue um in a more from a more informed stance um they recently launched this uh, uh i think a week and a half ago they launched this american for safe aerospace and ryan graves was a captain uh in the us navy um of f18s and i think he mostly flew over if i remember correctly it was in the west coast of the united states where he uh would have had the 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 experience where he ran into uap he claimed every single day on some occasions and missions Yeah, that's right. I believe he was actually on the the East Coast, but nonetheless, they were they they were having uh daily encounters. You know, and when we we think about these risks, I I'll share one of the the most interesting cases that that I'm aware of when it, when we think about even just commercial pilots. So we're starting to hear a lot of news from, you know, military and, you know, seeing stuff from our military uh data systems. Um but one of the most fascinating cases was uh the Japanese airline uh case flying over Alaska it was a cargo flight this was in 1986 it was in November 1986 and a just incredibly experienced you know pilot career pilot for Japan Airlines um witnessed a witness an object and and it was absolutely massive and this is something too that's just now starting to maybe kind of come into the mainstream conversation is that we we're, we're hearing about these kind of balloons or smaller objects or spheres that are flying over conflict zones as is being released by uh by the Department of Defense but there's also now we're kind of tiptoeing into some of the the larger obstacles that are being seen in our airspace and so if my recollection's correct i mean i think that the 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 sighting by the pilot for japanese airlines was i was massive i mean it's bigger than a football field and so of course we don't know of anything <laughs> that that you know at least has been disclosed that can can be that size and fly let alone anything small a sphere that's you know the size of a golf ball zipping through the the atmosphere without any you know flight surface um is unusual so you know we we're at a very interesting inflection point one of the the things that fascinates me is um well let's jump to you know politico So just the other week even since you know we we were planning this recording it was let's see when did Chris come out so Chris Mellon for those that don't know Chris Mellon was a former de- deputy deputy assistant secretary of defense for intelligence and he's put several opinion pieces out with Politico um which I'm sure you guys uh know so it's very interesting he came out June 5th was the Leslie Keen and Rob Blumenthal article June 3rd so June 3rd Chris Mellon really press the limits so Chris Mellon in 2017 kind of was helping with all this disclosure movement from his position you know coming from the intelligence community but he put out what i think was 
probably his boldest opinion piece yet in Politico, um, getting into the topic of crash retrieval programs and craft. And of course, then the big breaking story came, you know, 48 hours later uh, with Leslie Keene and Ralph Blumenthal in, in the debrief. What was you guys' reaction when you, you saw Chris's, you know, piece, I mean, this is a, a kind of a, a quantum leap forward going from, hey, there's, un, there's things we don't understand in our atmosphere to, hey, wait a minute, we've got reverse engineering programs and allegations of, you know, off the world craft as, as the term has been used. So I should first, <laughs> I should first um, explain my position. So I, I am the founder of The Blind Spot, which is an independent um, news agency focused on finance markets and blind spots like the like UAP, where I get to experiment with all sorts of interesting topics like UAP. And 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 obviously Dario works with me. Um, he's been a he's been a early member of of of, of Team Blind Spot. But since the beginning of this year, February, I've also joined Politico as a senior finance editor, and I have an agreement with them where I work four days a week for Politico and one day uh, for the Blind Spot. And the Blind Spot has a licensing agreement with Politico to repackage, uh, to to re repost uh, behind my paywall some of their articles. So I have a close working relationship with, with Politico. However, Politico itself is quite fragmented because there's Politico Europe, which I'm part of, and then there's Politico America. They, they used to be two different entities. They've now merged on, under Axel Springer. So getting all that out in today's interview, I'm very much doing it on my my blind spot hat on. Um, so I don't speak for Politico on this topic because I had nothing to do with that piece. And I did read it and I was as surprised uh, as everyone when I read it. And it came from the US arm. So I don't think people in Europe were even that much aware of it. And it came... Um, from the kind of magazine section, I think. So it was fascinating. And I mean, I was quite surprised that we Politico is 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 so open-minded to, to, to post that. So yeah, I mean, for me, I'm not as, I'm not in the weeds of this. And I read all these things with incredible kind of curiosity and I, I find it very interesting. But Dario, I'm sure has, you know, Dario has been educating me on a lot of this stuff. And I know Chris Mellon uh, from you know, what he's been telling me be beforehand. So I think a lot of the stuff in the Politico article was, Darius, would you say it was pretty much already known? Just, um, you know, it's the fact that it was formalized under a mainstream n uh, media name that I think made it have a punch where, where you know, other, other areas of the internet community, uh, you know, other, other publishing areas of the internet community don't get as much traction. Is that fair, Dario? Yeah, definitely. And for, I mean, for me, the Mellon's comments in terms of what they contain, it's obviously, these are very old claims. Um, essentially they have, they have essentially not changed since, uh, as far as I'm aware, since the eighties and nineties, when this, uh, the, the UFO topic and American holding of evidence was broached again after it was a bit killed with, uh, after the Condon report and the Blue Book report of the sixties. But there's one particular thing, and this is something Ross Coulthard touches on in his book, In Plain Sight, which is a worthy book of uh, reading, very good book that condenses the historical events over the past decade. And the most worrying part is Chris Mellon was a former undersecretary for defense in the Navy, which is, as far as I understand it, one of the most senior posts in the um, naval establishment, or at least in naval intelligence. And I think people should really focus on the fact that he may be being, if he is an actually completely honest when he says he had no idea about this and that he wasn't briefed and that he didn't have access to this. This is the real story because it's not necessarily just a story about hidden objects in different parts of the, the U.S. intelligence establishment. It's the fact that the hierarchy of the U.S. military isn't informed about them, which is a much more, it's even more consequential um, because, again, we don't have evidence about, you know, the fact that there are these craft or not. The issue is they don't know either. And so this is obviously the most counterintuitive outcome of this. And it's something that I think the public is at least prepared to understand, because we would all like to think that if there are people keeping this a secret, that it is somewhere at the top of our hierarchies. But if it isn't at the top of our hierarchies, where is it? Absolutely. And, and I think this is going to be a, a much more concerning and publicly visible issue as these these things kind of bubble to the top. So in fact, you know, the the big breaking news which I think m most of the audience is aware of was the the David Grush whistleblower 
that had come out. And this is something that I've been talking about for a while and was really, no pun intended, high on our radar um, as a inflection point for this entire theme because the whistleblower language that was packed into the 2023 National Defense Authorization Act. So this was really key for us to, you know, be on the lookout. Um, what's fascinating about it, I mean, his testimony in and of itself is just mind blowing. It's it, and, and we only know just kind of the tip of the iceberg since the majority of that was um, was and remains classified uh, information. And so a lot of his testimony was, you know, behind closed doors on that. What's starting to come out right now, which is concerning, you know, so as, a, as, as an American with, you know, tremendous interest in this, this theme and, and disclosure, um, during his testimonies, you know, there was something like 20, 20 representatives from the House, you know, or their staffers that participated. But from the Senate side, it was almost a no-show. And this is concerning because we do have folks like Senator Marco Rubio, who's, you know, been very vocal about these things. But, you know, where are they? Why are they not, you know, in these extraordinarily important meetings? And one of the other things that I, I wanted to ask you guys about and get your take, because I think this is something that's kind of just kind of slipped through the news with all the other headlines out there, is that in addition to the, the 2023 National Defense Authorization Act, we just passed, the Senate, uh, Senate Intelligence Committee just passed the fiscal year 2024 Intelligence Authorization Act. And in fact, the press release for that was posted on Senator Rubio's site. And there's some very interesting things here. So we're going to go maybe even a, a touch more, um, you know, into the, the science fiction side, as, as, as you said, Isabella. And I, I think the 2023 is the year of science fiction for, <laughs> for markets and, and humanity. Two of the things that are, that are included in the budget with the, um, with the Intelligence Act is one additional funding and reporting, you know, for UAP. But what really caught my attention is that they have, you know, based on the Havana Act of 2021, they have increased funding for the CIA to be able to look into the anomalous health incidents of, of Havana syndrome. And this is interesting because what fascinates me with this is that this is where you start to see a connection between these two things in that, you know, when you look at the work that's been done by Dr. Gary Nolan, so Gary Nolan, you know, Stanford, you know, Stanford uh, doctor and PhD, and um, this is his wheelhouse looking at things like brain injury. And so he had been studying for the CIA Havana syndrome. And then it was later came out that what he was looking at was not diplomats that were, you know, down in Havana and getting zapped potentially with the microwave energy. But these were, you know, U.S. government personnel that had been in close contact with UAP. Fascinating. So I think that you're going to start to hear a much greater conversation into, you know, the... Because I, I mean, I hadn't heard about that, so... Last I heard about Havana was that there was a real debate about whether it even existed or whether it was in a lot of these diplomats' brains. Like, it, it was delusionary. Um, but, of course, it's, it, it's, you'd think that that level of government would, would not, like, mess around with... I mean, you'd, you'd think that they would have good ways of monitoring uh, employee health. <laughs> so it is, um, it's fascinating to me if that story has evolved to one where there is an anomalous phenomenon that goes beyond just being in a Havana embassy. Well, there's there's two elements to it. One, um, again, it, it made some, some decent U.S. news and then kind of faded away, but it's the reason I believe that the Havana Act of 2021 was passed, is that what happened was... Wait, these... wait, wait, so that's, sorry, this is me interviewing you now. Um, so wait, there was, so the, there was a Havana Act passed to deal yeah. with... Wow, that totally went over my head. Yeah, it kind of slipped through. It got some, some headlines a while back, um, but just kind of, you know, slipped through. The reason for it, and it really, it really merits more attention because what sparked the, the deeper look into this was because there were similar brain injury reports and events happening on U.S. soil. 
Huge difference. So it's one thing, I mean, it's concerning enough that that would happen overseas. Um, it's far more concerning that that would be happening on on U.S. soil. And and I, too, was I, too, was blown away when I when I heard Dr. Nolan speaking about this. You know, at first it made he's the right guy. He's one of many people that would be appropriate to understand the the commonalities in, in the brain damage. But when he then revealed that what he was looking at was Havana syndrome, um, you know, victims, I guess you would say, or, or, or patients um, had the identical, identical, you know, patterns that you would see for people with um, that came in close contact with UAP. And so it's fascinating. It's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So, you know, we have, there's so many technological breakthroughs happening simultaneously. And, you, you know, the genetic side is, is as scary as the AI side and, and everything else. There was also a blurb the other day. I haven't been able to track it down, but um, there's reports of a, of a breakthrough with being able to, I, I think, kind of synthetically replicate, you know, sperm and eggs, but without any... <laughs> without any need for human <laughs> genetic material or something like that. And, and that's wild. And, you know, Intel's getting ready to release a new chip. There's, there's projections from serious people suggesting that we're 13 months out away from, you know, being starting to cross the threshold of having personal quantum computers. I mean, we're not ready for commercial ones, let alone anything near personal. And this goes back to Isabella. I think what you were saying at the, be the beginning of this is that just the, the potency of everything is so much greater now. So whatever UAP may turn out to be is that the, the amount of technology that's landing in humanity's hands is, is significant. And on that, how do you guys see, so, you know, you guys cover the world and, and, and the blind spot uncovers lots of these, you know, these, these unseen corners, where do you guys see, you know, from a conflict perspective, maybe let's take, take a step back and look at this through a geopolitical lens, all these things that are going on. How do you see geopolitical conflict, you know, rolling out over the next 12 and 24 months? you know, related to any of these things? It's really interesting you ask me this because I am of the opinion that there is geopolitical kind of tension out there on a almost like a World War Three level. Like it's, we're not there yet, but it's on the brink. And <laughs> most people are still, despite Ukraine, despite Russia, despite growing tension with China, I think the average person, person is completely not aware of this and that's what really surprises me because I don't know if that was if there's ever been a time like that where you know whenever we've gone to to war I think you know I was I'm I'm a child of the 80s and I I I very much remember us going to to war in Iraq and you know even even memories of the Falklands etc like the, the, it, the Gulf Wars right the, 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 there was always a kind of debate there was always a there were protests there was there was some sort of understanding of the role that our nation would be playing in any of these conflicts on on a public level whereas now i think it's so wishy-washy it's almost like are we in a war is this prop like cause there's no formal declaration there's like this is a war between ukraine and russia but we're obviously involved we're supporting them but are we is there a democratic mandate for it? Like, how how are these wars really, you know, do, is there a sort of, from a risk, again, I'm, I'm talking about it from a risk perspective because it kind of reminds me of of finance <laughs> in the sense that when banks had all these off-balance sheet exposures, right, and they were technically not on the balance sheet, so therefore, the, the, you know, they weren't, the accountants didn't, didn't understand those risks. And then suddenly you saw 2008 and we realized that the scale of exposure off balance sheet. And when it came to the crunch, the, the parent companies had to bring all that risk back on balance sheet. And I see the current sort of geopolitical system a little bit in this, in a similar way, in the sense that there are all these sort of shadow, not shadow, but like proxy wars going on off balance sheet from the main democratic sort of nations, states, balance sheets. And eventually, like, 
they're going to have to be brought back on balance sheet. And that means at some point there's going to have to be a democratic kind of decision whether we support these wards or we don't. And that's why, um, and, and, I, and I worry that one of the reasons our governments aren't necessarily being upfront with us is because they're concerned that when it comes to the crunch, we might not, we might not agree with the, with the elite whether or not we should be going to war with China or with whoever, right? And, and that is why, you know, you then go into kind of Noam Chomsky and manufacturing of consent and, and the sort of like essential element of having pu- the public on side in these things. And this is where the disinformation stuff <laughs> comes into play and why, you know, why there's so much tension in the free world about what can and cannot be talked about with these, with these, you know, things, right? So that's how I view the current situation is that, these tensions are getting ever greater. There's going to be a point where the public is going to have to approve these things. And if they do, that's either war on a massive level or it's a complete shifting um, international norm because the alternative, I think, is realizing that the the American-led rules-based order, you know, is under threat um from different from different challenges so and 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 it's going to be up to us to decide how much we concede uh to other norms right so i think that's where we are and either way our current paradigm is being challenged it's a question of whether we we fight or we don't fight you know that's how i see it and that might and 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 and, and just looping back to where i started is that I don't think anyone understands the depth of this and on, on, a, on a public level. And, you know, when I do talks, because I guess I'm in a little small community where we, 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 we talk about these sorts of risks all the time. But, you know, having just this week had to do a presentation in front of sort of a completely different group of people. And I realized it just goes over their heads. When you talk about finance being embroiled in like this whole idea of military military civil fusion and how investment is no longer being led by sort of free markets or or um or what is you know the most efficient pathway for capital right it is being you know there's everything from friend shoring to security oriented um preference right so this is this is this idea that we're going to be investing in stuff that is nation you know we're not necessarily going to be getting our supplies from chinese companies anymore that sort of stuff that is that that hasn't really penetrated i don't think and it's very confusing for the for the general electorate i think because you know they've been told for ages that globalization is good for them you know that this is anyone who wants to be um defensive or focused on on sort of parochial investment, that, that this is like small minded. So it's there are conflicting messages. Um, so that was me kind of draw, very long winded answer to your question, but it's very confusing. And and then tie that into you know the the dollar hegemony thing, and 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 I think we are in a new position now. Um, it's not like you know for twenty years dollar has been kind of there have been people you know saying oh it's the dollar. The dollar era is over for, you know, they've always been wrong, right? And I'm a bit in between. I don't think the dollar is going to disappear or anything. Um, I just think it's going to be challenged. And I'm actually not convinced that the challenges are, are going to come up with a better system. But either way, there's going to be a capital cost to that multipolarity because we can't assume our dollar can travel as far and wide. Like, but that, but that, uh, I'm not. I'm not in the camp of like, oh my gosh, the ch- you know, their systems are superior and they're going to take over. I don't think that at all. I just think we need to step up. <laughs> in, indeed, and and I've got a quick comment and 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 just follow on question with that. So, you know, you've mentioned twice, you, you know, today something a word that's very very near and dear to to my heart and and Neil's as well is risk. And I think one of the things that separates out the, you know, the best traders and portfolio managers in the world is that they tend to they tend to come uh, at markets through the risk lens and working at understanding it and defining it before they they get into the opportunity side. And I my experience, career experience is that the majority of the industries does it backwards. 
They look at what's the opportunity, what's hot, what are the themes, they chase those. And, you know, having read your material for many, 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 many years, you know, that's one of the things I've always enjoyed is that you you really identify, you have a knack for identifying those things. What do you think is, I mean, UAP is such an asymmetric risk that, you know, as we discussed earlier, it's it's very hard to, how would you hedge it if you could? You know, that's it's so unique. But in in things that are maybe more known topics and available to to dig into that people aren't paying attention to. And most people just don't do macro, right? So, you know, kind of connecting these 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 global dots is, remains uh, elusive for them. What do you think is the most underpriced risk in in global markets right now? I mean, there are different levels of underpriced risk because there's like, you know, normie under like okay <laughs> let's frame it for different prisms right so so like normie prism i would say the biggest underpriced risk is the deindustrialization of europe um especially germany right i still think you know there's been a a, a kind of perception that we've handled the um you know uh, the sanctions well that we got through the winter everything you know done and dust all the central bankers are patting themselves on the back because inflation is turning and you know it's all fine we can handle it right well, I'm, I'm not i'm not necessarily convinced by that and i think um it's come at a huge cost it's kind of the deindustrial at the cost of deindustrialization which ironically makes us more dependent on um non-friends if i mean if you're going to be all like us and them i mean we're not necessarily going to be able to to navigate that de- deindustrialization without ongoing imports from from asia or becoming more dependent on the us right and that's where you see uh france getting a bit like shirty because france doesn't like to be a vassal of america so macron's going around <laughs> you know saying strategic autonomy trying to have his cake and eat it so there's that sort of level of risk. Um, and I think that ultimately plays into like what happens to Europe. And Europe is going to be the, you know, Europe is going to be the deciding factor either way. Everyone wants Europe and um, how Europe flows is, is again, is that similar dynamics to World War II, ironically. And then you've got um, the sort of second order of risk, which is this, you know, new realm of unhedgeable risk in some ways where the extremes are so great. I mean, you saw, <laughs> we had a prelude to this. It's, just, I mean, it's, it's interesting that Ted Kaczynski died last week because obviously he was a terrible murderer and, and I would never condone him, but his book, you know, his manifesto was kind of flagging <laughs> the risk of what happens to systems when they become so codependent and so um you know the system itself becomes bigger than the individual parts right and can you you know his advice was ridiculous sort of live in a log cabin and 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 you know go back to basics but but as we as that system becomes more and more borg like as i would say if for star trek star trek fans the extremes of falling out of the system, the impact, and you saw that the global financial crisis. So every crisis gets bigger and bigger. The consequences is, is the Tower of Babel effect, right? The fall gets more, and there, there's a really great systems-minded um, physicist whose name escapes me right now from the Santa Fe Institute, who, who talks about this sort of idea of, you know, innovation gets getting quicker and quicker and quicker. It's going beyond our capacity, our physical capacity as humans to be able to deal with the change and with the risks. <laughs> so it's, and it's that foundation trilogy idea, like we're at the point where civilization crumbles, it's going to be hard to like pick up and go. So you have to have these contingency plans and foundations and ideas of how society can, you know, so we don't have another dark age. And like when I read when I read Foundation series, I didn't really think that would happen in my lifetime. But that's the risk, right? What? How do we hedge against the collapse of society because we can't keep up with the pace of innovation? You either have to have a totally coordinated system where everyone is aligned, or some deep in like resilient mechanism in it to ensure that we can handle that level of technology without blowing ourselves up, right? You, you know what else we've 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 talked about internally with our our team, and the best way I can express it is that 
we are also entering a phase shift in an exponential increase in the weird factor. And I'm going to I'm going to kind of define that, not just that there's, you know, UFOs and then and then next maybe there's craft and then next maybe there's there's bodies. Um, I've got a pretty wide aperture because I grew up around these things and I like science fiction. I'm a kid of the 80s as, as, as well. But that being said, and, and Kaczynski is a very uh, a, a very good talking point on this. Things that even for my very wide box, I would have been like that's ridiculous you, you know um kind of the most fringe conspiracy theories each day we inch nearer to the the more far out they are it's like the closer we move towards them and i'll just cite two that are very interesting so if if with kaczynski himself one of the things that i was unaware of until watching the kind of the reenactment of his life that they did on on netflix um he was part of the cia experiments with mk ultra they did those crazy, you know, MK Ultra was insane, and we know that it took place. I didn't know was, that actually. I didn't either. Yeah. I, I, I that was I when I watched it like six months ago. I was like, oh my god, that's that's wild and 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 sad and very sad. Um, you had things. I'll, I'll cite another one that again, this stuff sounds bananas, but you know, here we are. There's been allegations for years, of course, that there's UFO cover-ups and secret engineering programs. I believe all those things. Those things, I can get my brain around them. But the allegations that, you know, there's secret alien agreements that they signed with Eisenhower and stuff like that, I'd be like, that's that's ridiculous. However, you have recent testimonies <laughs> that are rolling these things out. We had, as part of David Grush, he's claiming that, you know, forget Roswell, that wasn't the, you know, the starting event. It goes back to 1933, and Mussolini, through back-channeling with the Vatican, I mean, these are like bad movie scripts, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, and the Vatican coordinated with Mussolini to give us a, a retrieved crash, for, you know, craft from, from Italy. It's just wild. And so I see this, this amplification of the weird factor. Um, you know, and Dario, you, you, you know, you two have had, you know, we talked about this earlier. You, you've also been around this stuff a, a long time. What's your perspective? How do you see this unfolding? It's, it's absolutely wild that the wild, that the weird part of the claims are seeing so much light of day. I really didn't expect this at all. I expected us to be stuck on the UAP conversation, maybe non-human intelligence. In a few years time, I had no way of knowing and I would never have predicted that the conversation on crash retrievals would appear so prominently um, on, on um, well, so prominently, not as prominently as it should, but prominently enough, um, especially the whistleblowers as well that, that have been coming out, that have been rolling out uh, in recent days. Um, there was also, you know, the more controversial Stephen Greer um, um, disclosure project that was run alongside it. But uh, it's, it's absolutely nuts. I, I also didn't expect it to be connected to the German UFO um, line of research. It's an extremely promising trail of research, but it's extra it also incredibly polluted um, because the vast majority of historians on it were neo-Nazis from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Of course, there are some decent ones. Um, I, liked, I put the Nazi UFO, if there's serious people talking about serious things, and then there is, on the other extreme, unserious people talking about unserious things. The middle is serious people talk, uh, talking about unserious things. So Joseph Farrell is a sort of controversial researcher just because he's quite out there, but he's okay. And he has a number of very good books on, on the Nazi UFO mystery. And of course, there's a number of projects if people are interested in the Magenta crash in 1933, uh, they should look at the Ananerba of the SS, the implication that the Ananerba were initiated into the secret where the SS, the, I forgot the actual original acronym, I think is something like Shooting Squad. Um, the actual secret name of the SS is Schwarze Zone, the, the Reich of the Black Sun, uh, which is this, you know, the secret sun of, of, uh, of a darkened initiation. And so there were a number of projects and claimed projects in Nazi Germany that are an absolute mess to get into from a serious historical lens. Things like uh, Victor Schauberger and his uh, spiral uh, UFO. We have no evidence that that ever flew. We do have some kind of evidence that he ran um, he ran a, a, a lab in a concentration camp and he managed to get the Jewish prisoners uh, clothed and well fed, which is an indication of his importance if such reports are true. And that his research was then essentially engaged in some, there was some American investor that engaged in a kind of a fraudulent action, allegedly, to steal his research. 
Uh, and then there's also uh, Fleissner's uh, saucer prototype. But something that really goes on, on uh, that, that's important to say, all of these German projects are ramjet or conventional uh, propulsion system. So that there's very little implication that there was actually unconventional generators. But we are also engaged, or, or I am also engaged in, in some research on the so-called electromagnetic rocket called the KM2. It's a very little known uh, research project that allegedly occurred, uh, occurred in Marbella, which is my hometown, which is where I am currently in, with very promising leads. And it's essentially based on the, on the physics of T. Townsend Brown. Um, it's this idea of using a dielectric to create a vacuum in front of any uh, flying craft that will pull the, the ship into the, the vacuum. I, I have a wonderful physicist that I'll, I'll introduce you to that is, uh, that's, his, that's his wheelhouse. And, really, that, uh, I, that, that'd be amazing. Yeah, he's kind of a garage scientist, but that's his that's his uh, his thing. Yeah, it's 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 interesting, and you know, one of the few areas where I'm optimistic because there's lots of things to be worried and scared about, um, which is 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 normal. But at least I think that this is opening up curiosity about you know about science, which is good. You know, is that everybody's distracted with you know social media. And because of the weird factor, there's a lot of there's a lot of reimagining and curiosity about history, which has also been missing. Right. People are just so distracted. You know, a lot of you know, a lot of kids have no sense of geography, history, math or many other things. So so there's a lot of kind of opening up about that. Graham Hancock's uh, series that he did on Netflix was really interesting, kind of, you know, inspiring a whole new generation. Of, there's there's tons and tons of, of young folks and um, coming into archaeology now because of that that series. And so I'm optimistic that we'll see, you know, we'll see some new things there. Isabella, do you, do you think that I share your concern that it's like almost nobody cares, <laughs> right? You, you have like, we're, we're Cuban missile, uh, crisis level, you know, geo conflict out there. And yet you talk to, you know, most people and they're just like, eh, yeah, you know, we're talking about nuclear conflict, but whatever, you know, whereas before, again, much like yourself, I'm a child of the eighties, like that was a big deal. You know, like, do we need to be ducking underneath the, you know, school desks and going into bunkers? And, and I'm just amazed when I talk to people every day as, as if it's just a non-risk. Yeah. I mean, the nature of the media, I think is to blame because we've had this sort of fragmentation. Everyone operates in their little silos and, and news is very bespoke to you. What, you know, what you feel is important to you. But the problem with that sort of frame framework is that you can never know, like uh, unknown unknowns. Like if you you need a, a third party to show you some stuff, stuff that you might be interested in, but you, you don't know you're interested in because you don't know about it, right? And I think this is this is one of the reasons why you have mass fragmentation, unless you have incredibly curious people who who know where to look and are polymathic in, in, in mindset, and not everyone is, um, you, you end up in these little little silos, which is making, it is a kind of Tower of Babel effect where, where everyone's going off and, and, and the, the, the end result is a sort of, it's a reduction of knowledge, right? Not a uh, increase in knowledge. So we don't have that shared sense of, of commu you know, common, Sto like the stories are not common between us. Like there used to be like the nine o'clock news. Everyone knew what was on the nine o'clock. We all watched it together, right? Um, so we could communicate things. COVID really was the f was different. Like COVID was the first time we had that sense of like everyone knows the same story. But it, but unfortunately with COVID, I think <laughs> there was it wasn't just about agenda setting or communicating and providing information. There was so much, it, like the media went from total fragmentation to being so incredibly on the same page and not kind of questioning any of the, of the kind of authority view on things. And now it's led to, I think, an increased loss of trust in the media by a lot of people. Not everyone. I mean, a lot of people still, still are quite happy with what the media you know how it, they handled it but like let's 
think forward, hypothetically, say there is some disclosure event, is it going to be handled by the media in a in a kind of COVID style way? Will we have the five o'clock briefings? Like, what, what, how is it going to look? It, unless you have a kind of global coordinated media push, I mean, this like to us, this 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 late latest you know story is a big deal, but like. I guarantee you, like you walk down the street, most people, a lot of people do know, but like my mums in my community, like they had never heard of it. It's just not on their radar. It's not something that they, they care about. Like, so until it's, until it's something that everyone knows, it's going to be um, ignored. But for that to happen, you have to have a massive paradigm shift and or a threat because he, I don't know, David, do you remember like even in the early days of COVID, like there was a sense of, this isn't going to be a big deal and let's just ignore it. And then suddenly something changed. Um, and I think it, it was Italy, right? Italy made it like freaking hell. If Italy can do this, then, then so, you know, so it might happen in our countries too. And that's what changed the framing. So what would be the Italy moment of UAPs is the question. Like, would it be the moment that Congress sort of like wheels out a, craft that they've had in the, I don't know I mean, what would it be I don't know well one of one of the one of the um, uh, postulations we made in the recent article that we've uh, we've gotten out on um, UAP aerial safety is that this moment could be a UFO 911 essentially and we distinguish the idea of a UFO 911 not because jihadism was a new thing jihadism had been happening for decades before but what specifically changed with 911 is that the cameras were on the towers as a plane hit, people were paying attention. And this is what differentiated, that's a critical differentiator. Obviously there's the idea of scale, but there couldn't be a UFO 911, even if UFOs have been a risk forever because nobody cared and nobody was paying attention. So essentially what happens is that we are in this position now where because the conversation has been so critically shifted towards non-human intelligent craft, you know, putting aside the fact that we have to look at UAP as a bundle of hay, it's literally the inspector general of the IC and all of these whistleblowers that have forced this conversation to the intelligence side. One of the things that kept on coming up in my conversations with experts involved in aerial safety is the idea of intelligence is crucial for determining the outcome of an accident. So if it's judged intelligent, it cannot be it, it would be judged malign. And then once it's judged malign, that triggers the kind of procedures that, uh, for example, the aircraft crash isn't covered under all insurance policy, but under war insurance. And you know, it's it's incredible if suddenly a crash is not an accident, but a terrorist incident, essentially. And so we are now in this position where the continuing talk about crash retrievals very much puts to the fore the idea that any upcoming crash may be this COVID moment. Because again, a picture speaks more than a thousand words. And I'd say if we if we don't get the pictures of the flying saucers, we'll get pictures of charred bodies. And then, well, then the other element this time message. to consider, and sorry to interrupt, but is that with deep fakes and with what is possible with deep fakes um, and this sort of trust issue from COVID, because I think people have finally woken up to the fact that there was a lot of B-roll that was reused and reused and, and it wasn't all organic sort of, like there was a bit of media manipulation in terms of how the story was presented. I think the question is, how will the public react? Will they believe it, what they're seeing, or will they presume it's a, a, a fraud on them for other purposes? And you've got high-level people like Elon Musk going around saying, I'd know if there were aliens and I'm saying there isn't any. And then he's like putting out esoteric tweets saying, trust nothing, not even nothing, you know, or what, whatever he said. Musk is super weird because he's always specific. He always says aliens and UFOs specifically. UFOs technically don't really exist. It's a category of something we don't know about. So UFOs, you know, you're right if you say UFOs don't exist because technically they don't. It's just a, a category. It's a completely artificial thing we've made up. You know, obviously there will be something behind all of these UFOs. Or they're um, not, not I, unidentified to him because he knows them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or he knows what they are. Exactly. The same thing goes for aliens. If it's non-human intelligence and if it's interdimensional, then they're not aliens technically. So he's also telling the truth. And then also it comes to the fact that Elon Musk's family has been trying to find fucking Atlantis for the past like few decades. So, you know, 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's confusing. You know, funny enough, I uh, coincidentally a few years back um, before COVID, I actually uh, through a mutual friend, I met um, Elon's right hand man at uh, SpaceX. And, you know, over drinks, we were having stuff and I brought up the, the topic of, you know, of, of UFOs and he was just a complete jerk. And, you know, he was so dismissive of it and not in a like, not in a way where I thought like he maybe had information and, you know, needed to like, doesn't want people to be paying attention to that. No, I, I think he really believed that, you know, loading uh, sticks with, you know, fossil fuels and pointing them you know at our atmosphere was absolutely the, the future and, and our method to get to Mars. So it, it was interesting. Um, and another thing too, that I, I wanted to, to, I, I wanted to bring up, this is something we're looking into. I've spent a lot of time, you know, over the years uh, looking at the aero defense industry, you know, s separately apart from the UAP stuff, definitely a lot more in relationship to it. Lockheed Martin in particular, as well as Raytheon. Um, your analogy of the 9-11 uh, thing is, is a fantastic analogy and, and framework for thinking of things. And, and it brings some curiosity to mind, you know, one of the testimonies, you know, Greer, Dr. Greer, so for those listening, Dr. Greer uh, is a former ER surgeon and has been in the disclosure movement for 30 years. He's a bit of a controversial, you know, figure in the UFO community. He's definitely brought interesting testimonies to bear, but also is, is you know, has had some challenges himself. But one of the testimonies that took place on, on Monday, the one that captured my imagination and attention the most was a Raytheon contractor working at the South Pole, which I had to look this stuff up afterwards and we're still in the middle of digging into it. I had no idea that there was an ice cube neutrino system that's that's basically, you know, part of the CERN program that's at the South Pole. And that that seems to be the case. So I didn't even know we had that type of stuff. And wait, 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 guy, wait, 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 what? So CERN has an official like neutrino experiment in the in the South Pole. And the, they do. Yeah. It's literally it's called, I, 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 it's completely nuts. Like, this is what I'm saying. So this is back to the weird factor, right? So look, there's been, and Dario, you know, this, there's been allegations of secret UFO bases in the South pole, the Nazis, you know, flew UFOs there. And this is where, again, like I, I I'm so familiar with the wide body of stuff, but I've got a, a fat filter that takes out a lot of those, those things. But here you have a, a Raytheon contractor, who was in charge of the South Pole Station, who's telling us about a neutrino system that you look it up and CERN has it. Google, everybody listening to this, you know, Google, you know, Ice Cube Neutrino South Pole. And and he's claiming that that system is for, you know, faster than light communication for tracking UFOs coming into, you know, our, our atmosphere. And that as they turned it on, and we're calibrating, trying to calibrate this, you know, this machine or system, um, they set off the earthquake in, in Christchurch, New Zealand. And so, you know, back to your kind of 9-11 analogy is like, I mean, this is, it's just wild stuff. It's, yeah. it's, it's wild it's, stuff. It's completely wild, but there's, there are some, yeah, there are trails of evidence for the Raytheon thing. I mean, it came out of Stephen Greer and this guy's claims had surfaced in 2011. Um, and, the counter narrative is that he was actually um, a cleaner at the at the Raytheon base, but you never know with these things. So on the on the fact side, there's something very interesting that you can look up if you want. It's called mimic waves. So the mimic stands for morphed integrated microwave imagery, and uh, this is an array of satellites that's uh, the, from the CIMSS, and it looks at you know the the Earth. And there are a number of anomalies that are these kind of like radar waves that are bouncing off from Antarctica, from the place where the Princess Elizabeth station is. And that's really strange. And you can see that on the satellite imagery and it kind of bounces out of, of Antarctica. So it's called again, Mimic. Um, and you look up Mimic, images in Antarctica, it's kind of hard to find, but there's stuff there. Um, and then there's other things that point to Antarctica. Like obviously we've all heard of Operation High jump, which is this Admiral Byrd, who was an admiral in the U.S. Navy, that sent a, a, a little bit too large of an expeditionary mission to the Southern Pole with like 5,000 men and an aircraft carrier, which finished early in what some people say was unnaturally early. He did an interview in Argentina where he said, we are going to see uh, threats moving from pole to pole. He didn't actually say extreme speeds as a mistranslation of the Spanish, just said it's going to be quick, you know, but he didn't reference extraordinary speeds. 
attributes. But there's some interesting things that were in Antarctica as well. There's this weird map that you can also look up, Nazi map to the center of the earth. It doesn't really say the center of the earth, but it's about how to get to the, to the South Pole. And it's this idea that there's underground lakes that are warmed by volcanic, uh, un- what do you call it, like understructures that essentially a U-boat can go through. And that essentially the U-boat commander, because a compass, a compass wouldn't work on either pole, or at least not the ones of the time. And so what the submarine guys were, were instructed to do is they had to chant a song uh, and time it. And then as the chants were happening, they would have to turn left, turn right, and to do it that way, and that that's how you would navigate with a song. So this is all in the realm of a bit of fiction and of myth, because of course there's no way you can ever verify this information. There's a guy who claimed to have bought at an auction in Mexico a Nazi compass that um, would guide you, would point to the north, by having a photo photosensitive apparatus that could see the position of the sun or the moon and where it is on the horizon to tell you where the north was. And that obviously implies that, you know, these are systems to navigate in the north or the south pole. And there's the last thing I would say on that is the Strava leaks, which um, this was Strava is this really fun. Uh, it's this really brilliant concept where you buy a fitness watch and then it tracks you and uploads your information for anyone to be able to stalk you online. It's really, yes. uh, <laughs> it's really a groundbreaking uh, thing. And so obviously a lot of soldiers in the US and the CIA used this. And a few years ago it was leaked. And this has been wiped. I can't actually find this, but there was a man called Cliff High, who's you know a very controversial individual in his own right, but and a lot of other individuals pointing to the fact that there was these Strava uh, data in you know Antarctica that suggested there were underground bases or even bases uh, at the bottom of uh, these pyramid looking mountains that are next to Princess Elizabeth Station. And then you're just sitting there like, this makes absolutely no sense. Why are they down there? Why don't we know about it? If there are people, what is there? So what do you make of these stories? If, because obviously the evidence trail I'm describing is super spurious, but it is what it is. And with these things, we can't dismiss anything. We're at the point where we really can't dismiss anything. Guys, I, I, I appreciate all your insights on this. One thing I would like to do is, you know, we're, we're crossing over the, the hour here is um, something to leave the audience with is in, in such a strange world, you know, you guys are, are, are avid readers, researchers, writers. What, so a question for each of you, what inspires you about, you know, our future and, and what's a book that you'd recommend? For, for those listening. It could be anything that, you know, anything that, that suits you. Well, what inspires me about our future is that this is uh, something Carl Jung talked about, uh, that the idea that we're in a, this so-called astrological age of Aquarius, and you can make of that what you want, but how it's reflected in reality as theory is that there is a dissolution in the structures that govern our society and our institutions, so that the state stops working, religion stops working. And... Um, Naturally, this conversation leads us to the thought that, you know, society may collapse as, as the Brookings report of 1960 something uh, uh, implied. Um, but that really fills me with hope because I was born into a world where the governments were boring. Democracies didn't really seem to work. There are no new ideas. Catholicism was a joke. Uh, and so are all of these major religions. And suddenly here we are at, this, at the center ground of a promise for a new world and a new era. And I don't know if that new era is going to be an asteroid crashing and making us all very good at survival techniques. Um, but regardless, it's something new to look forward to. It's great that we are not going to end up in the future we were promised, but maybe something a little bit more exciting and less boring. And I would say that the book I would read, which is not necessarily related to this, but it's the most important UFO book. It's Messengers of Deception by Jacques Vallée. You read that book and you will understand that the phenomenon as it's, or the phenomena as, as they're called, are not straightforward. It's not straightforward aliens, and it has to do with us. Great recommendation. Great recommendation. Isabella? It, it really depends on what kind of um, mentality you have. And some of us somehow are gifted with the, you know, ability to look beyond current paradigms and imagine. I mean, people read... It's funny, because a lot of science fiction people, people who like science fiction you'd think that they would be very open-minded to this stuff, but actually they're, they're some of the most skeptical people out there. That's right. So, um, so I think it's about what kind of brain type you are. And if you have that natural curiosity and capacity to kind of think in like beyond your sense, that immediate senses and, and whether you have a, 
an element of dare I say spirit, spirituality to you or, or not right and I think whether you do or not um, is down to the makeup of your of, of, of your brain sometimes you know or whatever the spark of life I, I don't know what what determines whether you're in that way inclined but if you have curiosity about these stuff about these things I think you're either going to be very very frightened or very Tario inspired and and hopeful for a big paradigm shift if you're of the other mindset I think it's more of a sense of denial and and it'll be very either way but whether it goes good or bad it'll kind of shift and upset your worldview and could be quite traumatic um and I'm not and I'm I don't think that other mindset is necessarily going to be able to handle um these sorts of paradigm shifts some of us are more adjustable than others so that's how it's how I would frame it and I I personally so what I say is from my mindset which is more of the kind of open-minded but I think I unlike Dario am more concerned about the bad aspects of it so I'm a bit scared myself but at the same time I think this the scared part of me makes me think it's it's essential for us to rise to the challenge and to like I said whether it's dollar markets or whatever we have to up our game and fight to make sure that the best outcome um that we make the best of this very precarious situation as to a book i mean i would just say everyone should read isaac Asimov's foundation trilogy i think it's a it's such a great book because it channels the sort of the collapse of rome and this idea of i mean it's, it's a civilization-esque sci-fi book that tackles everything from technology to finance and risk everything it's also paul cookerman's favorite um book apparently but that's and 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 i do also throw in like watch adam curtis documentaries because i think he's really like he's great at sort of joining all the dots and making um making kind of see beyond your own little uh, fragment of reality so that's what i would say and our article on UAP. Oh, on and, UAP and Darius, I, I don't forget to read Darius' article on UAP. <laughs> wonderful wonderful recommendations across the board uh definitely both the 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 inspiring whether it's you know how how we survive or or you know face our future and great book recommendations great article recommendation for definitely those you listening get get on the blind spot check out their work they do fantastic stuff Guys, thank you both, Isabella, Dario. Thank you guys both for making the time to to do this today. Really appreciate you guys coming on and 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 sharing your sharing your views. And um, look forward to talking to you guys again soon. And with that, Niels, turning it back over to you. Thank you so much, Isabella, Dario, and David, for a pretty profound conversation about the future of civilization and all the recent revelations coming out of the U.S. administration on UAPs. I think for me, one of the really scary things that Isabella touched on is that most people, and I really mean most people, are not informed or paying attention to what's being revealed. And how will we react if we suddenly realize this through a potential 9-11 moment, where due to the fact that most people are carrying mobile phones with a camera, we may all suddenly see things that we could never imagine happening in front of our eyes. This time it's not going to be buildings collapsing, but potentially something we thought would only be part of a science fiction story. Now, I know these conversations that we are having in this series will be difficult for some of you who are regular listeners, but I think they're important. As David mentioned, on the podcast we often talk about risks that we see and that we take, and why should this not be part of that conversation? I think it should, but just like with investments, being early may not always feel good. And I know that we are really, really early in this discussion, but that is by choice. And don't forget that the background of both Isabella and Dario, they have some really serious journalistic and intelligence chops. So we should pay attention. Anyways, I hope you're going to stay with us during this conversation and uh, make sure you go and follow Isabella and Dario's work over at The Blind Spot as well as David's work, of course, because as you can tell from today's conversation, there are many exciting facets to learn from those who have 
been in the trenches for many years in areas that perhaps are not our own expertise. And we really look forward to exploring many more of them in this series. From David and me, thanks ever so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you on the next episode. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.